Give him a praise. Amen. Amen. Oh, man, that was really horrible. Give him a really good praise, would you? Do, would you do that? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. It don't hurt to give him a little shout every now and then. Amen. All right, before you sit down, shake somebody's hand and tell them, I'm already missing summer. I'm already missing summer. Tell them, already missing summer. Man. I tell you. I tell you. You can be seated for a moment if you'd like. This, uh, this is not my kind of weather. What about y'all? Uh, y'all like this cold stuff? Well, you, you bunch of psychos. I'm going to be praying for you because you're obviously something wrong is between your ears. And uh, uh, anybody who likes this kind of weather, you need to move north. Move north if you like this kind of stuff because uh, I, I tell you, I like it warm. Uh, if it's if it's around 80 and above, I, I can really I'm digging that. But this cold stuff is it's just not that much fun to me. I I don't care for it. And we had did you notice the usual thing? No fall. There was no fall. One day was summer. Got up the next morning. It was winter. Did you did you see that? So now they say we're going to go back and pick fall up. But I don't know about that. I, I don't know. But y'all be praying about the weather. What I would like is I'd like it to be like it was a couple of weeks ago, year round. Would you join me in prayer with that? Anybody? And one, two, three, four. We're, I, I, feel, I feel that I'm, I'm in the minority on this one. But uh, you guys be praying. Thanks for coming out to Edgeway Church this morning. Appreciate you being here. Sorry I'm stuck up here in the place of Mark. He's upstairs teaching a class uh, covering force today, and we appreciate him doing that. We appreciate you uh, being out today, coming out to church. Thank you so much uh, for coming and hanging out at Hedgeway Church. And, uh, we probably have some guests. I saw a couple of folks I didn't recognize coming in. So home folks, let's welcome our guests and say thank you for being with us. We appreciate you being here so very much. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, we're going to do we're gonna do an offering here in just a moment. I'm going to thank you in advance uh, for your giving. Uh, man, we just appreciate you so very, very much. Uh, now, last week, last it was just last Sunday, right, that, that we did the, the, the medical missions offering and, uh, uh, for Guatemala. And uh, we have a little video that we'd like to share with you. And this is why we're sharing it. Uh, because we had people call in and said, couldn't be a church last Sunday, but I saw you uh, on Facebook or whatever, and we want to know if we can still give towards that offering. We said, heck yeah, so we want you uh, giving, and uh, we want you understanding what's going on. So have you got the video ready to rock and roll? Punch that thing, and you'll see what you're giving towards, and then I'll give you the figures.
Amen. That was a good job. I say we praise the Lord for that. You probably saw some folks in there that you recognize. Uh, the Noonans are heading up another missions trip. They've been doing this for years to Guatemala and Haiti. But I think that uh, what's new in their lives is they're in the process of birthing uh, a brand new outreach ministry, a brand new missions uh, venture called Salt and Light Ministries. And uh, uh, they're, they're, they're in the very middle of it. And uh, uh, we're doing our best to help facilitate it in any way uh, that we can. Uh, it, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to verbalize when the Lord places something in your heart and tries to bring it through your life. Uh, you've probably been there and you've experienced it. And you know how the burden and the passion uh, that the Lord uh, places on you for that. And you look around just hoping uh, that you're not crazy and somebody else catches a glimpse of that, of your heart and that passion. Now, last week we gave, we gave about two grand, about $2,000. And uh, uh, the, the, medic, the medicine, I think, is around 3500 the medication that they carry in, and then they carry in two to $3,000 worth of food on top of that. So if you'd like to give towards this, this medical mission, uh, that's about, it's going to be going on over Thanksgiving holiday. If you'd like to give towards that, you can do so. You can, you can see us. You can see them after service. It doesn't matter. You can drop it in, in the bag we're about to pass around. But please make a notation that it is for the medical mission and not the, not the general offering that we're about to do. Uh, but please, uh, do what you can towards this mission. We've got so much coming up, and I know we lean on you guys so heavy this time of year, uh, but it's not for us. Uh, we've got this brand new opportunity in this medical mission. Uh, we were talking about ministering to all of our other missionary kids uh, around the world coming up uh, towards Christmas season. And so, you know, that's, that's uh, Joe and Jesse. Uh, that's, that's the Andersons, the Lapushis. Uh, that's uh, the Molers. Uh, Corey and uh, oh, I can't say their, their, their name because they're in such a dangerous situation uh, but they don't have any kids we'll just tell them tough luck have a kid so uh, 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 we, we, have these, we have these individuals we have our inner city missions North Little Rock, Arkansas, Hemlock Courts and Daniel House be praying uh, Greg's dad still not doing very well they've had a tough tough summer super violent uh, summer there at the projects at Hemlock Courts because they've shut down other projects and brought other families into this one project which means opposing gangs in this one project please be praying for them and uh, we just thank you for your giving you are so so awesome to give we provide Christmas for the kids at Hemlock Courts that's right around the corner we'll be passing out names as we do every year asking you to to uh, purchase a gift that we can take down to Hemlock Courts uh, the ladies uh, have have been uh, knitting crocheting whatever that is the big needles and the stuff and they they do hats they do scarves they do gloves for the kids down there and man i remember the first year they did that and i told them i said i said this is not going to work i said these are inner city kids and they ain't going to appreciate this stuff i said you don't know what colors to make different colors can get them killed you don't know what's going on. i told them everything they did wrong everything then we transported all the gifts down there we had christmas with them the kids got all their toys and stuff we were loading up the van to leave it was after lunch and we were loading up the van to leave and as we backed out to take off they're out there throwing footballs and and kicking soccer balls and all the stuff uh, that you guys sent down and you know what they're wearing they're wearing the hats and the scarves and the gloves i said look at those kids they absolutely love that stuff they absolutely love it and i came back and I told the lady who was in charge of that ministry, I said, I'm stupid again, and you have my apologies. I had no idea they'd love that stuff. We're fixing to take that down and present it to them. And so we've got a lot of stuff coming up in the Christmas season. We're asking you to, to bring in candy, bring in wrapped candy for trick-or-treat trails and safe treats. We'll be there handing out candy. Uh, as, they, as the kids come by, we've got wristbands for them uh, that says Hedgeway Church, a glow in the dark, and they eat that junk up. We'll be, we'll be handing out all this stuff, 
and then the Gideons will be there probably right next to us handing out Bibles. They hand out as many Bibles as we hand out candy. And uh, we just have a great time. I know it's a busy season. I know we lean on you heavy, and you guys always respond. And I praise God for that. So let's get serve team to come up at this time to receive uh, this, this offering today. Please come forward, guys. We appreciate you giving. Again, if you want to make sure it gets to the medical mission, you can give it to us. You can give it to the Noonans directly. Uh, you, you can do whatever you want to do. If you give it towards us, towards the church, we're just going to pass it on. Make it out to Hedgeway Church with a note that says medical missions, anything, just something to get our attention so we know. We appreciate you. We love you. Oh, we've got Thanksgiving boxes coming up. We'll be receiving an offering towards that next month. We've got Thanksgiving boxes coming up. We provide Thanksgiving for 100 families in the community. It's just, it's just almost endless, the stuff that your money does. Feeding at the school, the backpack program, everything that we uh, participate in. It only happens because you guys give. We appreciate you, Father. We ask that you'd bless this offering, Lord, that you would take it and leverage it and multiply Multiply it, Lord. I pray that it would go so to give. I pray, Jesus, that, that as, as people are given good things, that, that as they're ministered to, that they see Jesus in us, Lord. I pray this stuff opens the door for witness. I pray this stuff opens the door for people to know you. I give you praise and honor and glory in advance. We're calling it done. Father, blessing those who can give and those who aren't able, bless them double. They'll give next time. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. You guys say amen. Amen. Go ahead, fellas.
were seen
Amen. Hey, we'd like to join with you in prayer today. Take just a minute to pray for stuff and needs and challenges and things coming out. I'd like to pray uh, this morning uh, a special prayer for Emily's sister and brother-in-law, Josh and Megan. Uh, this is their first service in Helena, Arkansas this morning uh, where, where they're going to help uh, relaunch a church uh, that has just about closed its doors, just about over. And they left Butterfield Assembly in, uh, in Van Buren and uh, moved to Helena, and they're on a team down there relaunching Hope Church. And uh, we're believing great things for them. We are believing great things, man. God's going to use them. We're going to see a revival in the Delta area, and uh, they're going to they're going to be part of the team that spearheads it. I believe that. So we're going to be praying for them this morning, believing the best for them. And if you've got a need or a situation, you got something going on, would you stick a hand up if you need prayer? And we're going to take a minute. We're looking around. We're picking us out a victim to pray for right now. Let the Holy Spirit guide you, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you so thankful, Lord, for this day. Praising you, Lord, for your goodness, for your presence. Thanking you, Lord, for always being there always ministering father we we just want to take a moment your provision is astounding your care is is unfathomable your forgiveness your grace lord ministering to every need these needs of raised hands as you minister to every arena of life whether it be spiritual or physical or a, a relational or financial we praise you for that we take a moment this morning lord we're praying for josh and megan as you minister through them right now they're there right now lord and they're worshiping you and they're praising you father how we praise you that you're going to minister through them and through this church in the delta area i praise you lord for hope church and i know father you're going to see many many people brought into the kingdom of god and you're going to minister life in this situation and you're going to tear down strongholds lord in that area it's going to make such a difference in that part of the world lord how we praise you and we thank you and we take a moment to worship you, Lord. We take a moment to worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Minister through your word this morning and have your way in our lives, I pray. Believe in you for it now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Can you guys say amen? Amen. There's no shadow you won't Mountain you won't climb Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb
Good morning. How are you guys doing? Doing good? Good. Y'all look good this morning. Y'all's looking good. Thank you. Thank you. I can always count on Cody, the ventriloquist whistler. You never know that that man's whistling. It's really amazing. It looks like he's talking, but he whistles. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, Find him after church. Video it. He'll be an internet star before we all know it. And we'll say we knew him when it all started, right? You're welcome. You're welcome. Hey, so good to be with you guys today. I haven't gotten to get up and communicate from the stage in the past few weeks. We've been digging into uh, into this series, The Power of a Proverb. I've been laying it out over the last several weeks, and it's really been, it's really been powerful. I, uh, not to play on word there, the power of a proverb, but if you've really been digging into this with us, if, if you've gone home and looked back in your word as you've listened to what pastors had to say, I, I'm guaranteeing that you found some wisdom along the way. I mean, there's no doubt last week he imparted such knowledge that people walked out of here, figured out that women are crazy and men are stupid. So, uh, you know what I mean? We, we talked about that uh, a few times. He's like, all that time, all those words, I could have left it with a sentence, and we could have went home. But um, that's okay. Like any good preacher, who can leave it at one sentence, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't do that. So, hey, I hope you guys have been enjoying it. Back on September 29th, um, he was communicating to us, and he was giving us um, this, this part of the beginning, a four-week series going into a series, a four-week uh, groundwork for this, what we're looking in on this power of a proverb, and it hit me on September 29th as he was sharing about, that was the first time he introduced this thought of the seed in the soil, um, and he really delved into it in some of our foundational texts for this series, and I wanted to share something with y'all right off the bat that I had scratched down on my bullets, and I don't know if you take notes, I encourage you to take notes because you can go back and look at those God speaking to you during service, I guarantee you the Holy Spirit's trying to convey something to you, but I wrote something down, and I feel like it may resonate with you. I just scribbled it down, and and he said, man, we've been a month into this, and next week we're going to start the series, and we're all like, what have we been doing this whole time? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, okay, you tricked us. You got us, but this is what I wrote down. I wrote a month of preparation for a series, and then I put a few question marks. I said, what is God trying to plant in my heart throughout these next few weeks? And that's what I want you to be thinking about. What is God trying to convey? What is he cultivating? What is he working in your life through this series? So I want to invite you now to come back next week because uh, Don will be back. Pastor Don will be back up here speaking, and he'll be knocking it out of the park as always. So you got you to gotta bear with me this week. I'm going to try to lay some groundwork here for him to come in and spend the next few weeks as he continues to unpack the power of a proverb. So I wanted to open it up like this today. He's made, uh, he's asked us a question throughout the last uh, four to six weeks. He's asked us this question, and the question is, do we believe that this word has the power to, uh, to, to produce a good life, or do we believe that this word has the power to produce a life that is good? That has kind of been a question that we've been unpacking, looking at through the power of a proverb. And, and we've answered that. Yes, the word has the ability to produce good in our life, right? Um, the Word has that ability. We, we can live a life where our kids love us and they listen to our very command and we retire in some tropical destination with loads of money in the bank. Yeah, well, uh, yeah okay, I'm glad somebody picked up on my sarcasm there. I'm, I appreciate that. Thank you. What we found is that this Word has the capability of producing not just a good life, but a life that is good through the power of these Proverbs. That's what we have found. If we found how to live a life that can live, leave an eternal mark. So I need a little crowd participation. No, there's no hula hoop contest involved. I'm not going to bring anybody up here. There's no balloons. There's, I have no gifts to give out, okay? I apologize for that because I know you guys love a good competition just like anybody else in this world. But this is what I need from y'all. If you were born, I got to get my dates right. Ladies, this does not apply. You don't have to raise your hands. This is only for men, okay? Just a disclaimer. <laughs> Just putting this disclaimer out there. No, this is not being videoed. Nobody will go back and watch this and figure up exactly how many times you've lied about your birthday. So if you were born uh, 1945 or earlier, I don't, do I have anybody in here born in the year of 1945 or earlier? Anybody? Nobody? Nobody's born 45 or early. Okay, how about <laughs> we're, we're starting off good then. You guys aren't as old as you look. Awesome. So, uh... See, Dina, she's got all the makeup needs you need. Um, so uh, if you were born, you do. Like, you just got back from a conference, right? 
you were supposed to say so good. That was your time to do that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, um, that's the silent generation, 45 or before. That's what is uh, notated. Uh, anybody born 46 to 64? Any, any, baby boomer, any baby boomers? A lot of baby boomers in here, okay. Um, 65 to 76, Gen Xers. We got anybody? We got a few. We got a few, okay. Uh, millennials and Gen Y, that is 77 to 95. Who was born 77 to 95? That's not bad. That's pretty, y'all, it's a pretty good show of hands. I appreciate that. Um, and then you got Gen Z bringing up the caboose, 96 to somewhere in the early 2000s. All right. All right. We got some of y'all in here. What's up, college guys? Good to see y'all back there. Y'all looking good today. Looking good. All right. That's five generations. We have four generations present with us right now that we just went through. So I just, I named off five different generations, all the way from the silent generation of 45 or before, all the way to current right now, Gen Z. So I, right now we have four of those present. I'm, I'm speaking to four different generations at one time. I wanted to share a few things with you, though, from each generation. Okay, this is pretty, this, I, if you get nothing else out of this whole message, you'll enjoy the first part. So the silent generation, I looked up what are some words or some phrases that, that, that they grew up using. Now, some of y'all are going to know these, okay? Are you ready? Here's some of their words, made in the shade, right? What does that mean? That just means everything's cool. Ankle biters. Anybody still use that? Yeah, okay. You're not put, okay, this is where you don't want to show your hands because you said you weren't. Ankle biters, right? It says, it says you've got some cute ankle biters. What's going on? What ages are they? Does anybody know what a wig chop is? Anybody ever use the term wig chop? It means getting a haircut. Okay, good. I was just wondering. Uh, cut the gas, man. Cut the, that means cut it out. Don't want to hear you talking anymore. In other words, shut up, right? All right, baby boomers. These are the ones that I, I, I found 104 of these. I'm not going to share all of them. I know, y'all are so sad. Uh, I found 104, and I literally read through every one of them, and it cracked me up because I was like, I feel like I'm seven years old again. Anybody ever say, I got a bone to pick with you, right? It means we got a problem, a lick and a promise. <laughs> Hope it works. Yeah, that wasn't used long ago I, when I was born. Yeah, lick and a promise. Anyway, uh, all's well that ends well. It means everything's going to turn out all right. It all turned out. Blind as a bat. Anybody, yeah? Anybody ever heard that? You can't see a thing. I need some interpretation on this. Dead as a doornail. I mean, I've heard it all my life. I've used it a million times. Does anybody know how dead is a doornail? I don't know. Uh, pretty dead, apparently. I like this one. Fair to Midland. Yeah, I mean, you, you said that. No, not like Texas, not like the town of Midland. It's like we're, right? Okay, fair to Midland. Doing okay. And I'll save the best for last. Pertnier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that might have been an Arkansan baby boomer term only. So um, then you got Gen X. You got Gen X, right? They say the word like fat, like cool, easy, easy, P-H-A-T, fat, cool, right? Uh, word up. I agree. Uh, bogus. That's fake. Let's go kick it, right? That means, hey, we're going to go, I don't know, like I would say let's go hang out. I don't know, chill, right? Um, let's see. The bomb. Anybody still use that? Like that's, that's the bomb. Anybody? Yeah. All right. I like it. Thank you. I appreciate y'all owning up to the sayings that you still use. It's amazing. Uh, 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 then the, then that's, this is kind of where it became like a thing where it's like, that's bad. When you're like, that's good. Like it makes no sense. It's the complete opposite. All right. Okay. Millennials and Gen Y. Uh, some of these, actually none of these I've ever used. So I don't really know. I feel like my mom and dad rubbed off on me and I use things that were predated me. But anyways, here's some of the millennial, like some words that we use like woke, right? Anybody say woke? Like that stuff's just got real. I do use this one a little bit like, man, that kind of salty, like, right? Like I salty, like, not nah, yeah, a little rough, right? Like, whoo, that ain't a bad move. Then you got thirsty, wanting something more than you need it. Like that, let's not go there. Um, and then, and then there's this one that's on fleck. Is that right? Can anybody help me with that? Fleek. Thank you. See, I, th thank you. Appreciate you. Got my back over there. What does it mean? Like, everything's like, that's on point, right? Like, uh, uh, that's what I thought. Just wanted to make sure I didn't want to be giving out false definitions. Um, let's see. I like this one. I've heard this one a lot. Never said it in my life, but bye, Felicia, right? Like, that means, like, anybody got, bye. Yeah, I don't know who Felicia is, but I feel bad for her because she straight up just got thrown under the bus. That just means, like, get out of here. I don't want to deal with you. And then I have actually used this one, adulting. That's like when I'm doing those things that I'm like, when did this happen in my life? When did I start having to pay bills and like, 
take care of kids, oh, right? Like, God, kids, whose kids are these? And then I remember they're mine. Ah, oh, golly. Gen Z, they got things like bromance. That's like a male, a male friendship, right? You cray cray. You crazy. JK, just joking, right? LOL. Uh, all these things, right? All these, my bad. That means I'm sorry. Selfie, right? If you haven't taken a photo, like it doesn't count, like that kind of thing. And then you got totes. I do use that one because that's, I just like it, all right? And that means I totally agree. And then you got one of my least favorites ever, YOLO. You only live once. Way overused, I feel like. Yeah. Y-O-L-O, -O, you only live once. You know what I'm saying? And then you got this one that, yet again, I have no idea what it means, but I've been to youth camp, and I'll be walking by, and somebody's be like, yeet, yeet. I'm like, what is that? What is yeet, yeet? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Nobody's told me what that was. I, yeet, Y-E-E-T, but you got to put it together. I don't know. Yeah, anybody got an interpretation? Madigan? <laughs> I hate to put the pressure on you. Oh, whenever you, oh, so it's like four in golf. I get it now. Thank you. I feel a lot smarter. I appreciate it. So, I'm, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot better off. I'm a lot better off. Okay. Did y'all enjoy that? I told you. That would be the best part. Of the, I knew y'all would have a, a great time with that. All right, I got to do one more thing before we actually dive in to, to the Word today and, and look at something. I'm, I actually need some crowd participation. I'm trying to see where I got enough people sitting close together. I don't want to have to make y'all get it. I'm going to come to you. How, who do I want to pick on? Oh, there's just so many good options. There's so many. No, I'm not picking on y'all. The college guys are like, go get Edwin. I'm not doing it, Edwin. Me and you, buddies. Let's see. Hold on. I'm looking at y'all. Boy, y'all look a lot more serious when I come down here close to you. Look at y'all. Looking all serious. Okay, the Kimbrel clan. That's right. This got to go all the way to the roll, though. Okay, so this is, this is what you have to do. I'm going to tell you a sentence, and you're going to pass it down as quickly as you can. You can only say it one time, and then you're going to relay it. And I'm going to run around, and they're going to tell me what y'all said down there, okay? Now, y'all can't listen. It's called telephone. Yeah, right? This is what we're going to do. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to tell you the sentence. I hold a mic in front of your face. Thank you. Sound man, you got my back. Or y'all are sitting too close. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Are y'all ready? Look at me. Man, I'm so fast. Golly. No, I'm not in fast. I'm not in slow motion. That was me running. Okay. So what I just did was I went and I, this was what we started with. Okay. I told him this was the sentence. Tom pats his head while rubbing his stomach and licks his lips in cold weather. Okay. So, so seven people, and this is what I got. Tell me again. What was it? Tom Tom dyed his hair and licked his lips. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> Tom dyed his hair and licked his lips. So, <laughs> oh, that's good. So we just uh, gave out four different generations, five different generations. I just gave you sayings, phrases, words. Hold on to that. This is going somewhere. Don't, don't lose that, okay, through those seven. Remember, I we'll revisit that. But I gave you guys five different generational sayings that have somewhat transcended time. We still use them even though that's not from our generation. Maybe they've changed a little bit. Maybe we've changed words a little bit. But, but they're still conveying an expression, right? That's what's going on. So there are also stories that are handed down through generation to generation. Um, in certain cultures, it's like they, they pass down these stories, these sayings, and they bring perspective and insight. And some of these stories can be called parables. That's what we see happening 
back in Matthew 13, where we've been looking at Jesus in this foundational text. So if you'll pull up Matthew 13 back there for me. Let me see. I'm going to flip to it. If you got your Bible, you can flip to it. We'll be in Matthew 13. If not, you can look on the screens. We're going to pick it up. This is the parable of the sower. Like I said, this has been some foundational text for us in this series. Um, I'll just read it off the, screen, off, off the screen there. It says, On that day Jesus went out to the house and was sitting by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat down where, where, uh, while the whole crowd stood uh, on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and ate them up. <laughs> Others, this is really hard off the screen. Have you ever noticed that, trying to read off a teleprompter? I would be a horrible politician. Back to paper. Um, so where were we at? We said, Some fell along the path, and the birds came out. Others fell on rocky ground where there wasn't much soil, and they sprang up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, they were scorched since they had no root. Hold on to that thought, too. No root there. They withered. Others fell on thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. Still others fell on the ground and produced a crop, some 100, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. Anyone who has ears should listen. So that's some foundational text. That's, that's where we've been at some of this uh, process through the parable of a proverb. So I have a question for you. Does God speak to you? Does, I'm not as meaning like the audible voice of God, but does God ever lay impressions on your life? Does he ever try to communicate truths to your life? I guarantee you he does. Day in and day out, he'll speak to you through all kinds of crazy stuff. It's amazing what God will go to the lengths to be able to communicate to you what you need to know. He'll use all kinds of weird stuff, right? I mean, he'll use TV commercials. We were sitting, hanging out with some family last night, and one of the littlest ones went over to my, to my brother-in-law, and he got up in his lap, and he was talking about, he said, Dad, I love you, right? He's saying that, and he said, one night, they were just sitting in the chair. He said, we're just hanging out, and he's sitting on the armrest, and we're watching TV, kick back, and he said, he just looked over. He said, Daddy, I love you, and he said, man, he said, I had heard it from him before, but he said, in that moment, the Lord spoke to my heart. He can use kids. He can use TVs. He can use working on stupid stuff like lawnmowers, right? That's when he really likes to talk to me when I throw things. And then he's like, don't do that. And, uh, or maybe that's my wife. She's like, uh, no, no. Um, so he'll speak through you, to you in multiple ways, but lots of times he'll use this word to communicate truths, parables to communicate truths to us. So what we see in in Matthew 13 and what pastor had spoke to us about was that that you see the seed being sown and you see the soil and we established that obviously the seed is the word of God and the soil that's us there's different types of soil we are responsible for our soil so that's how we kind of fill in the gaps and he said a statement that I needed to reiterate and he said the seed changes the soil but the soil has everything to do with how the seed grows if you follow up Matthew 13 right after that, the disciples and stuff are looking around, and they're like, Jesus, what's up? You're, you're teaching in parables. And he said, yes. And why, why was Jesus teaching in parables? Because what Jesus was doing is what God still does today. He takes these infinite wisdom, this, this truth that is beyond our comprehension, and he makes it manageable in a finite way for people like ourselves. He breaks it down so that we can grasp a hold of this, and it's, and it's lived out and it's fleshed out in parables in the Word. It's fleshed out in different ways in our lives nowadays. But how do these parables make sense? Well, that's where Proverbs comes in, and you can pull up Proverbs 24 and 3 for me. This is out of the message trend. Translation. This is what it says. It takes wisdom to build a house and understanding to set it on a firm foundation. So here's my title for today. My title is Challenge of Communication, right? Seven people. I just, I gave them one sentence and we ended up with He's dyeing his hair and licking his lips, and that's not where we started. Now, there's some shades of truth in there, but that isn't where it began, right? Just like I gave you five generations of different words and, and verbiage that they used and things that were cool to say, and yes, they've been passed down, and we still use them in certain contexts, but we've changed some of how it's communicated. So how do we take wisdom and make it understanding for others? How do we take this word and make it understanding in our lives? How do we take truth that is timeless, 
This, this book is, is never changing. It is a firm foundation to build your life on, <laughs> but it wasn't written today. It wasn't written uh, in the silent generation. It wasn't written in the millennial generation. This word was written way back there. These stories are from a generation past, uh, from how people lived in that time isn't how people live in this time. So how do we communicate these truths and make them timely? Because they're God-inspired, and people need to build on these foundations for generations to come. See, Proverbs predates even the silent generation, the ones that were born 1945 or before, right? Wasn't even any of y'all in here. Or we have some liars we need to pray for y'all. But um, there's none of y'all, there's none of them present. You have to go back 700 B.C. to find Proverbs. Like I said, that's been a while back. We're a little disconnected from that time, from that spot. We're in Arkansas. This was not written. I know it's hard to believe, but this Bible did not, was not written. It was in Arkansas. That's not where this came from, right? This comes from a different cultural mindset. So in five generations, if sayings change, if, when, if within seven people I can start a sentence and it ends up with some shades of truth, but it's not the same sentence that it started with, how much do we have have to be mindful of when we're passing down wisdom that we don't mess up the communication process. Even when we're trying to receive wisdom, when God's trying to speak in our lives, that we are making sure that we're hearing it. See, in this time, we live in such a time that is considered a post-Christian world. That, that's what we live in. Now, this is, I'm going to share some numbers, and I'm not trying to get like all geeked out on y'all, but there's some studies out there that literally are mind-blowing. Um, the, the, the numbers are staggering. The figures are nuts, and it's hard to really believe. We live in the Bible Belt. We're in a ruler community, but this isn't far. This is, this is within our state borders, what I'm going to share with you about what's going on. But, but we're living in a post-Christian uh, time frame in the church, so, so we face some challenges when we're trying to communicate this word in a post-Christian time. I don't know if you've noticed, but culture changes pretty quick. Right, it's always it's evolving, and it's actually speeding up. It used to last longer. Now it's like I know some of y'all still got them bell bottoms waiting for that trend to come back around. You know what I mean? Like I saw some of you baby boomers hands out there. You got the flyaway collars. Who was I talking? Where's Ken at? That's who, I was talking to Ken the other day. We, I was like Ken. I was like we were, <laughs> we were hanging out and we were talking to him. I was like Ken. I was like dude. We were like, did you have a hippie van, Ken? Like, I mean, you know, he said, no, I had hair down to my shoulders. I was like, bring it back, Ken. It's going to come back. Leisure shoot. Like, come on, Ken. Like, come on. You can usher that in, in in Johnson County. We'll not make fun of you, I promise. Never, not one time will we take a photo and put it on the big screen behind us. But we're living in a very serious time in the church's age, how we're trying to affect culture because culture is ever-changing. During the past week, uh, Don came in and we got to sit down and we were talking about, about some numbers and some studies that have just came out from uh, the U.S. and from Canada. These numbers are, are pretty crazy. We are, uh, we are three generations into uh, unchurched people, okay? Um, so I, I got to make sure that I communicate this properly. Not three generations into people that's never heard about Jesus. It's, you can't really go anywhere around here necessarily. You'd be like, hey, have you ever heard about Jesus? Yeah, I heard about him. It's not that they never heard about him. It's that we're three generations into people living out life that they don't consider Jesus. They, they hit uh, a difficult time. What used to drive people to church sometimes, uh, tragedy, uh, turmoil, things like that, things ain't working out good, you're going to start praying. Like my grandma told me, I, best, I better be praying. You know, like I got a test coming up. I ain't got gas. That is, you fill in the blank. People used to turn to God in times of need. Now they're in times of need, and he's not even on the radar. That's the kind of world that we're living in. When I say unchurched, I don't mean it's not people that haven't heard Jesus. It's people that don't consider Jesus. That translates to in the third generation of people that are living unchurched, that's 24% of those people don't, don't consider Jesus. In the last 10 years, that percentage has climbed 9%, right? Is that right? 9%. That has increased in 10 years, okay? So if we're three generations deep in the last 10 years, like I said, culture has, has began to speed up the process. It's gained steam. It's changing faster and more rapid than ever before. So is this. Everything is on an accelerated rate at the time and, and place that we live in. So in the next 10 years, if it's gained 9%, even if it holds true, we'll be 18%. But the 
the, the realistic nature of this is it's probably going to be more than 9% in the next 10 years. It's going to grow at a faster rate than even that. So to, to put it in terms, as I was sitting there thinking about that, I thought, that, that doesn't even seem possible. Really, I mean, I'm like, that seems unlogical to me that that, that could be the, the time that we live in. But then I stopped and thought, I thought, okay, Don is my dad. If my father had followed his father's life cycle up until the very end of his life, but if my grandfather had never uh, encountered Jesus, even at later years of his life, if he had passed, or if he had lived that life and my dad had followed in his footsteps, I could effectively be a third generation Alexander living an unchurched life, raising a fourth generation of Alexanders that have no need for God in my life, that I just don't even, I just don't think about him. I, I, and that blow, it doesn't even seem like that could be possible, but that's how close I am to living a life of an unchurched person in this world. That's not a knock on them. I'm not mad at them. I'm just saying, like, generations before us, that it, it, it's not that far-fetched that there's going to be fourth and fifth and sixth generations not far down the road living these lives of an unchurched, building lives that are shaky. So how do we build on foundations of wisdom and understanding. In Matthew 13, it said, what did it say? I said, hey, hold on to that, where it said, but uh, when the sun came up, back it up to five, it says, others fell on rocky ground where there wasn't much soil, and they sprang up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, they were scorched, and they had no root, so they withered. That's part of the parable, right? And I was thinking about that, and I thought, uh, building a house. It says wisdom builds a house, but it says that understanding sets it on a firm foundation. The, the, the plant sprouted, right? The seed was planted in the soil. The soil effectively grew the seed, but only for a short time because the soil, us, the soil here did not do its part. It was not, it was not cultivated properly, so, so the seed died quickly. It had no real foundation. It's so crucial. So the number of the unchurched are continually growing, like we just said. It's, it's, it's at a breakneck speed right now over the last few generations. This is most in part, I feel like, due to the fact that we find ourselves uh, in life just, just living, just clicking along. Like we said, and, and, and me and Don sat and spoke at length about it, but he said, you know, he said, you too, people would, they would come against hard times. Something would come up and they would look to the church for help. But that doesn't, there's so many other outlets now. There's, there's other ways that people are going about dealing with difficulty in their life. And church isn't an option. There's all these trends, giving in churches down. But giving to organizations out of churches, like let's say the Red Cross, for instance, it is, it is, it is through the roof, or not through the roof, but it has increased as giving in churches have went down. My generation loves to help people right? If you do some research, they want to be involved with something that is making an effective change. So what the numbers show is that people look at the church and they're like, they're not meeting those needs. I'm going to go invest my, my stuff elsewhere, my money, my time, my resources, and my talents in things that are helping out, out there that I see the needs that need to be met. So it, this, is, this is, life is clicking along and you're investing in places, people are investing in other avenues, and in doing so, you know, when everything's going good, what, what do you stop and really think about when something's going to go bad? You know, like, do you, no, you just live in life. You just, you just going. You just, you're just clicking right along. There's a guy I like a lot, and in one of his books, he talks about that, about how in life, you just kind of click, click, click along, and he, he uses it like a roller coaster analogy. He's like, everything's cool while it's clicking, and then when the clicks stop, what happens? You're falling down the other side of whatever you just climbed up, and he was like, then it's just pandemonium. But what happens is, in culture, what I believe's cultivated over the last several generations is we're clicking along. We have homes that we're living in. The air comes on when we punch the button. We go to our car. It starts up every time. It's amazing. We drive wherever we need to go. Our kids are in school. They're getting educated. We're living what I guess you could say is the American dream or this American ideology of a successful life. Our, our kids, like I said, are, have gone on. They're growing up. Uh, they're going and getting educated. They're going to colleges. They're, doing, they're joining workforces, all these things. But our needs are being met. Uh, we have food. We have shelter. And we have a little bit of leisure time, right? And in that, what's happened is the, the American dream or the American culture was once rooted firmly in the Christian faith, but 
that has that has fallen away over the past several years. As you've noticed, it's become where there's these shades of what we feel like is Americana or what we feel like is the American dream is shades of love and acceptance. That is preached in the word all day long. Love and acceptance. Love your neighbor like you're going to love yourself. It would be amazed at what happens when you start treating people right. They might not treat you right, but at the end of the day, you've done what the word says to do. But there's absolute truth in this Bible. And what we've done in culture is we've kind of shifted away from that truth. And as we've done that, we've passed down wise words, but we've passed down no understanding. And without understanding, we're building houses that were never made to last the long haul. So here's a question that I want you to write down, and I want you to think about it over the next week and over the next several weeks. This is such a strong question. What causes a person who is comfortable without God to consider him? What causes a person, what causes an unchurched, third generation, 24% person that's clicking along in life to consider a God that they would never wise have thought about previously? What's going to do that? Back in Matthew 13, I said, the, the disciples come up to Jesus and are like, uh, right after the parable, they're like, why are you teaching in parables? Like, why are you telling this story of the sower and the seed and the soil? Like, what's, what's up with that? See, they understood what Jesus was saying. They had been hanging out with Jesus. They had insight. And basically what Christ answers largely, verses 11 through 17, is he's saying, you know, I preach in parables because the things of God are made more plain and easy for those who are spiritually dull to receive. You know, this wasn't really for you. It was for them. They, they need to receive this. And, and the gospel he was saying, will be life for some, but it'll be death for others. Man, that's tough. He said a parable like the pillar of the cloud and uh, of, of fire, right? It turned a dark side to the Egyptians and it confounded them, but it turned a light side towards, uh, uh, towards the Israelites and, and it comforted them. And so here you have like this double, this, this, this parallel there, this double intention, and it's the light that directs some and it's the light that blinds others. So herein lies this challenge of communication. Here, here we're trying to communicate truths to people who haven't even thought about God or Christ. Maybe they have, but they're like, this, doesn't, this isn't for me. This isn't for now. Like, this is 2019, dude. Like, you were talking about 700 B.C. Like, that's before, like, my granddaddy's granddaddy's granddaddy. Like, I mean, nah, I don't really know how this applies now. So it's this challenge of communication. So what causes a person who is comfortable without God to consider him? Uh, you're, you're here. You're in the chair. You are what causes that person to consider a God that they've never thought about. I mean, these numbers are tough. This is like, for me, this is heavy stuff. This is very difficult. Don shared, Emily has shared some about, uh, you know, some of our family in eastern Arkansas. 600,000 people make up the, the Arkansas Delta. When I said this stuff lies within our state lines, it was no exaggeration. It lies within our county. But there is an upper and lower Delta in Arkansas. 600,000 people live in these, in these communities and in this region. 6,000 of them go to church on a regular basis is what they said. They did studies. That's 1% of a population that's located from here. They don't consider Jesus. They're unchurched. They're three generations deep, right? You might walk down your road, knock, knock on two doors down, and that might be the same case for your neighbor that gets mail two doors down from you. Who's going to, how's God going to be an effective witness in their life? He's going to do it through you. Living a life parable could be the most effective way to minister to people who have never considered the answer of Jesus, who are searching constantly, looking for answers. People are more physically fit, more financially set, more whatever, all these things that, that, they're, that they're aspiring for, they eat better. They, like I said, they're going, like fitness has taken a huge role in people's lives because studies show if you go out and walk a little bit, it's amazing what it'll do for your longevity. But nobody's dealing with spiritual issues. You can build a house, but it has no foundation. And so right here, as we're looking at this, the culture that we live in, it gives us so many platforms to convey truth to a world that may not consider God. 
We have social media outlets. We have all these different ways. To some, it will just be a blinding light. But here's the good news. To others, it'll be that beacon of hope. It could be the very one spark that they needed to consider God. I know it seems like I'm preaching to people that are outside of these walls. You're like, why are you telling us this? We're here. We're, you know, we obviously make this a priority in our life to show up on a Sunday. And I, I'm appreciative of that. And I'm thankful for that. And it's going to take that to be effective outside of these walls. Hedgeway, Luke 14, 23, was built on the thought process of effectively ministering outside of what people think of the conventional church. Going outside of these four walls and meeting the needs of people in a community, in a state, in, in a country, and literally globally. I mean, y'all just watched videos of being able to give in as people that are sitting here today are going to go and effectively communicate the gospel through love and through service and through what we are called to do day in and day out. So there's these instances I was thinking about how what, what, would that, what does that look like in our lives as we live out this life parable? What does that even mean? Put it in some context for me is what I was trying to think. And I thought about, well, what if you're on your job and you have a fellow employee that, man, they're, they've, been, they've been in a rough time. And they've looked everywhere but to the church for help. Or you got a family member that they have went way off course. They are off over here in this ditch and they can't figure out how to get get their life back on track and they just they just need they just need some help they're just looking for something and they can't find it or or your finances you sit down and you write out all your bills and you write out all your checks and you pay all your stuff and you look and you're like god this is not very much left but i want to honor you but god this isn't very much left like can a little can a little really honor you god or that doctor gives you that report that you weren't expecting and you take in the information and you're left very stunned <laughs> And you're like, this was just a routine checkup. And now I have this issue. I have this medical condition. I have whatever's going on. And there's all this stuff that plays out in life as life is clicking along. And you'll think of wise words will come back to you. Maybe your mom or dad or your grandparent had passed down something to you. But you need a foundation. You don't just need some wisdom. You need something that when you're shooken, you can go back and be like, I know my feet are planted. And so when that coworker comes to you, you go, hey, let me offer a word of encouragement. Let me open this Bible of mine, and maybe I can share a passage with you. Now, I know it was written a long time ago, but let me tell you about this truth that never changes. Let me tell you about this God that loves you. Do you mind if I just take just a second? We ain't got to be showy. We ain't got to make this weird. If you want to walk out back by the dumpster, we can pray back there. I don't care. But I, I, think, I think maybe I could just pray with you, right? That family member, you pick up that phone, you call them. I love you. I love there's always a way back. You know, come, let's sit down and let's talk. Let's see what we can do. When you look at those finances and you go, man, to some, this looks like pennies, but God's like, I'm judging you by your heart condition. This isn't about, this isn't about what you're dropping in there. It's about you are trusting me in every venture of your life. You're honoring me, not just through your talents or your time, but you're giving me what I've given to you, right? It's about when that doctor gives you that report and you're like, doc, I know that's your job, and I thank you for that. And I know God's put you in my life. And I'm going to be praying. I'm going to go back to my church family, and we're going to be believing for a healing. And I'm going to be praying for you guys and your medical staff because I want you to have insight into this. And you know what? I want God to heal me so when, when the next guy comes down the line and they got this same issue, you can be like, I remember Bob. Bob had this, but God healed him. But look, we learned this from this situation, so let me help you. I'm going to help you in this. That's what it looks like to live a life parable by extending those hands and by doing these things, that's how God can begin to reach somebody that's never thought of him. When you live a life with a foundation on the word, wisdom will speak through your life. You won't be searching for words. You won't be trying to come up with something clever. It will flow from what's inside of you. As you cultivate the soil and allow God to plant that seed, it will produce a harvest. But the beauty of the harvest is the harvest is not for you. People that plant and farm, when they, when they get all their stuff, when they go and they harvest their field, do they keep all of what they had? No. It goes to the store and I buy it so I can eat my food, right? Their harvest isn't just for them. The harvest isn't just for you. Your harvest is for those around you. So 
as that happens, and as, as God begins to harvest these things, this, all these things from your life, it will make people begin to question. They'll ask themselves, why is that guy different from me? Why is he walking through some situations that I've walked through, but yet he goes home and he actually goes to sleep at night? How does this happen? They begin to do self-reflection and self-examination. And that's when you begin to be able to share that word. You begin, begin to be able to relate these timeless truths through communicating to them on their level. Yes, it is a challenge at times to communicate to different generations. You can tell by just seven people in a simple sentence. It gets difficult. It's challenging. But your life parable becomes that lens through which people will begin to see a need for a God they'd never thought of. And that is the amazing part of living out the Word. That is what God intends for us to do. Jason, if you guys want to come up, I know we're about to shift into communion. I want to wrap it up like this real fast. I, I wanted to share a quick story with you guys, and I'm going to make it very brief. I had a dream. I don't know. We, we were actually meeting with some guys the other day. We were talking about Somebody was talking about they have, like, really vivid dreams all the time. I'm like, I never have, like, any, like, meh. Like, I wake up, and, like, it's real cloudy. Like, I remember something for three minutes, and it's gone. So, though they're not, I had this dream, and I mean, I woke up. I woke up, and it was super, super strong. I mean, it was so real to me that when I snapped out of it, I wasn't even really awake. I was in this weird in-between stage of, like, knowing what my reality was, but that really left an impression on my life. And my dream is very simple, and I'm going to shorten it up for you. I had this dream that I have a daughter named Paisley. She's five years old. She's in kindergarten. She was a little older in my dream. I don't know how old she was, but me and Emily had decided to allow her to go to this place. It's in town. We're in Clarksville, and it's like down where like McDonald's is. But in my dream, it was like a one of my favorite places, an Andy's frozen custard. It was like this thing like that. It was like this big ice cream place with all these lights and stuff, and all of her friends were down there. And so we were like, yeah, it's cool. We're going to meet with some people at the house. I remember we were meeting with some people about some church stuff and we took Paisley and we dropped her off and like I, I, I told her I was like you do not like you sit at this table this is, you don't leave this table I don't care what you do you do not leave this table and we left and we were going to come back and get her in just a little bit of time and I don't know what we met about. I don't know what all that happened. I just know that in my dream, we were driving back. And when you're going down the hill past Pizza Hut, you know, you can see down and see the interstate and, and all that down there. Like in my dream, I remember coming off the hill and the interstate was there, but the, the lights for the place was really lit up, but they were all off. And a mom had called Emily and said, hey, I went and picked up my daughter. I just wanted you to know they were shutting down early tonight. And we're like, well, we're on our way. I'm like, Paisley will be there. It's fine. Like, it's cool. And we get there and we're coming off the hill and it's dark. I mean, it's like a ghost town. And we pull up. And we pull up and we got out and I remember in my dream. In my dream, I was already mad. I had chosen to be, I had chosen to be mad because I told Emily in my dream, I remember this is so me and this is why it's so upsetting. We get out and I was like, if she has moved off that table, I'm gonna kick her rear end up between her shoulder blades so high, right? Like she ain't gonna be able to hear nothing because it's gonna be hiney cheeks on both sides of her head. You know what I mean? Like I was already like, I'm about to line this girl out if she moved because she can't be going anywhere. And I was already in my dream. I was already frustrated because I didn't know if she was there. And nobody's there. And we get out of the car and I walk around. And I'm like, Paisley, Paisley, come on, Paisley, where are you at? If you're in the bathroom, get out here. And Emily's like, Paisley, she's real sweet. Paisley, where are you at, Paisley? Where are you at, babe? She's looking for her. And, and I come around, I make three circles around the building. She's nowhere. And in my dream, I couldn't find her. And I remember I ran. I ran up the hill to Pizza Hut and I went to the strip mall and anywhere that was open. Have you seen my daughter? This is her. Have you seen her? Have you seen her? Have you seen her? And I was frantic. And somehow I end up back home. I don't know how I get back home, but I get, I get back home in my dream. Emily's like so cool. She's just like, it's going to be all right. And I'm like, who are you? We can't find Paisley. And, uh, and in my dream, we got this little hall in our house and all of our rooms are on one end. And in my dream, I remember I'm in the hallway and I, I darted in her room thinking, well, maybe, maybe somebody brought her home and I didn't know. And I run in and she's not there. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, we have got to find her. And, and Emily is just like tucking right into bed, like just super cool about it. And she's like, nah, we need to go to bed. It's getting late. I'm just like, I what? I'm just like, I mean, in my dream, I am, I'm in pieces. I remember the last image in my dream. I was literally laying on the floor. I was hurting. I did not know where my daughter was. And I'm just, I'm just, I remember yelling, Paisley, where are you? I'm just, I can't 
find you. And I know you're looking for me. I'm dad. You need me. And I woke up. And when I woke up, I was in this weird, I don't know, this weird place where I knew I was in my bed and I knew she was safe. And I was like, God, that was a weird dream. And it was so upsetting. And then the Lord began to communicate. And uh, I rolled over and I grabbed my phone because my dad is cool when he told me. Anytime you feel like God's putting something on your heart, you need to write it down because you're not smart enough to remember it. And I was like, gee, Dad, you know how to encourage a guy. You know what I mean? And so I rolled over and I typed in my phone briefly the little bit of the dream. But what I typed in there was what I felt God was saying to me. And God was like, Seth, do you know what you felt like when you were looking for Paisley? Do you know Paisley was looking for you? And I was like, yeah, man, like I get it. Lord, like quit raking me over the coals. This is ridiculous. Like, come on. I just want to go back to sleep. And he was like, every day, every day, I'm walking around and I'm calling out to my sheep. He said, every day I'm communicating my love and my affection that I am for them, that they need to come home. That's what he's telling me. And I was like, okay, cool. I get it, God. Like, I know. I understand. I got you. And he was like, but what you don't get is some of them can't hear me. They don't even know that I'm looking for them. They don't know that they got a dad. They don't know they can come home. They don't know anything about any of this, Seth. You, your daughter's looking for you in your dream. You knew she needed you. He said, but in reality, there's people that you walk by in Walmart. There's these people that make up your community. You don't got to go halfway around the world, Seth. There's people that need me now that they can't hear me. They can't hear me. I was like, all right, Lord. I didn't know what that dream was even about. Man, I mean, I knew what it was about, but I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? So I did what any good person does. I told my dad. <laughs> I was like, Dad, I don't know what this is about. It's actually, no, I didn't. My wife smarter than me. I told my wife, and we laid down one night to go to sleep the next night, and I was laying there, and uh, I was like, I had this weird dream. I didn't even, I hadn't even wanted, I didn't even want to tell nobody. I was like, I had this weird dream. And I tell her the dream, and she doesn't say anything. She just goes, did you tell your dad about that? And I was like, it's a great idea. No. And so I come and I tell him about it, and we, we had a conversation. And I didn't know if I would get to share the dream. That dream is really, man, it's so real to me. It's so real to me. It's not real to me because it's Paisley. It's real to me because, yes, God used that to communicate in my life. But I pray today that the Holy Spirit uses it to communicate in your life. I pray that when you're at work, when you're at play, when you're at home, when you're doing chores, oh, all those things in life that we do, that your life parable, when you don't mean for it to, that it will show people what this book says, that these words that are on a page become a living testimony. Communicating is challenging. Communicating is challenging. So, God, we pray today, Lord, as we're shifting gears, we're going to gather around your table. Man, God, we're thankful for that. But, Lord, right now we pray that as you communicate to us, as you speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Help our life parable be that lens to a world that's never even considered you to stop and think about you. Not because we're awesome, but because what we possess on the inside has made effective change on the outside. God, we love you and we thank you. Amen.
you know the Lord is your Savior? That's what he's trying to communicate today. And, and I'm always very careful when I say that because I'm not asking you if you belong to a church. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized or sprinkled. I'm not asking if your name's on a book somewhere. I'm asking, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? That's what he's trying to communicate. And if you don't know him as your personal Savior, if you haven't said, Jesus, forgive me my sins, come into my life, that's what you need to do right now. You need to receive him. Seth just read to us from Matthew 13. You can hear it or you can take the step and receive it. It's in receiving that the difference is made in your life. It's in taking action on the Word of God. Every head bowed for just a moment. Every eye closed. Father, how we love you and we praise you and we thank you that you go out of your way to communicate your love to us. You work overtime, Spirit.